I'm Patrick Sang, global citizen, investor. Join me as I talk with global influencers for their insight, wisdom, and how they overcame their own personal challenges. Sharing positivity, overcoming challenges, creating one world together. I'm Patrick Sang, anything is possible. Welcome to another episode of Anything is Possible. I'm in the Grimaldi Forum in Monte Carlo. It's the Monaco Streaming Film Festival day one. I have a special guest, Gary Springer. Gary, thank you for your time. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. How are you doing, Gary? So Gary, um, what are you doing here? Well, I'm wearing a number of different hats here. Um, I was initially uh, uh, introduced to Tony and the, and the crew because I had done a film festival in England where I spoke about my life and my father's life and um, I have a, a talk with like 184 pictures and then I go and it's like an hour and a half talk and then that's how I initially came but then a group that I work with uh, called IAFTA which is based in Monaco called the International Emerging Film Talent Association then got subsequently got involved so I'm involved you know through IAFTA as well as them bringing me separately um, and what I'm doing today, for instance, is I'm, I'm, I'm with uh, Christian Moore uh, and, and, and Brisa, and I forget Brisa's last name, but she's from the uh, uh, Princess Grace Foundation. Yes. And with Carmen Franco, who you were just speaking to, we're going to talk about kind of old Hollywood and, and uh, new Hollywood and Monaco and how it's all tied in. And again, we're going to utilize some of these pictures that I have from my dad's film archive. He's got 192,000 movie stills sitting in a mountain in Pennsylvania uh -huh. that Getty runs. Um, and so we've picked about, oh, I don't know, about 20, 25 pictures to show during this talk. Um, so that, you know, that's, and then I'll kick it off, you know, because it's talking about old Hollywood, new Hollywood, and now going into streaming and things like that. Uh, the other hat I'm wearing is uh, for IAFTA, uh, Marco Orsini, who is a, a, a Monaco resident, he directed a film called Beyond the Raging Sea, which is about two Egyptian adventurers hmm. who decide to raise awareness for the refugee issue and join a, a race to row across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, they made it eight days and about 500 miles and then capsized. And uh, it was a remarkable rescue because there was nobody out there. It's just two guys in a rowboat in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and then it ties into the whole refugee situation and we worked on that with UNHCR, you know, the United Nations um, High Commission for Refugees and UNDP. And um, we're showing that as the spotlight film tomorrow before the awards. So I'm wearing my other hat of publicist. And, and you know, I've sent out press releases for that and I've gotten a couple of interviews from Marco about that. Um, so it's like, you know, my dual, my dual activities. And then I'm also doing another panel on Monday, I believe, about uh, uh, the future of content, streaming content. So, Gary, what, what, what don't you do? I don't, uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't take out the garbage too much, you know, I'm a little slob. But, um, no, I'm, I'm basically, I, I grew up, my, my dad was probably the, the, the number one independent press agent in the world for a long time. He represented people like uh, Richard Burton, Elizabeth Teller, Marilyn Monroe, Monty Clift, Marlena Dietrich, Henry Fonda, uh, Betty Davis, uh, Joan Crawford, on and on and on. So I grew up. So the up, DNA's right inside. Yeah, of the, I grew uh, up in that world. Uh, Marilyn Monroe was my babysitter, which is part of the pictures that we're using in our talk today. Wow. Okay. So I, I, I often sometimes say I'm probably the only guy in this room who's been in bed with Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. On multiple occasions. A couple. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I grew up in it and then I went off and I acted for 10 years and mm -hmm. I did a bunch of movies uh, mm -hmm. Dog Day Afternoon with mm -hmm. Al Pacino, mm -hmm. Jaws 2, Small Circle of Friends mm -hmm. and other things and then just decided you know I don't like acting, Holly, I don't like Hollywood so I moved back to New York and I started working for my dad mm -hmm. and uh, I really like it and you know I do the publicity, started doing film festivals, um, I've been going to Cannes since 1995. Oh. Um, I actually 
did a film festival here at the Grimaldi Forum mm. in 2007 for IAFTA. That's oh, wow. how I got in, in, introduced to this um, International Emerging Film Talent Association because they did a film festival for emerging national, uh, international film talent at this uh, venue. So what's, what's your like, main passion? Is it media? Kicking back and not doing a damn thing. I like uh, that. I've done it. I've done it. I've been working, you know, I'm 67 years old. I've been, you know, as I said, I've been basically doing this since I grew up. Um, I love doing what I do, though. I really do. I love working in the film. I love the film industry. I love the technology of the, of the, of the film industry. Mm. Um, you know, this whole streaming aspect, which is what this festival is based about. It adds a whole new layer to it. Um, you know, during the whole COVID problem, uh, it really hadn't bothered me because I closed my office in Times Square in 2015 and I've been working by myself. And actually, I got busier during COVID because of all of the, um, the streaming that, that was happening and all of the virtual cinema situations. And there became a lot more movies that were released. And that's one of the things besides representing film festivals is I, I also represent movies in the US that are going into distribution. And so it actually, you know, the COVID situation where a lot of people were out was fine. <laughs> I mean, we, we as an investor, we, we, we actually did very well during COVID because you just have to adapt to the situation. Now, when COVID passes, which it will at some point, then life will, will, will have a new undertaking. And how do you feel about streaming in that respect? Well, I mean, I think that, it, you know, I, I, I think that it's something that is, is here to stay. Um, um, I'm not overly crazy about a lot of aspects of the streaming and... and uh, I, I'll bring that up in my panel on Monday on, on the future of content and streaming because, you know, I think that, yes, my son, um, th who we'll talk to about in the next section, um, <clears throat> he'll sit in his bed and watch his phone, you know. Um, I, was on the, I was on a plane the other day. Um, I was walking down the aisle, and there's a guy watching 1917 on his phone. That's obscene. You know, 1917 is a huge epic, and I'm sorry, you know, I mean, I know that this is the future and this is what especially younger people do, but that's just wrong, you know, and that, you know, but the aspect of it is that it's there because of streaming. True. Um, you know, but um, um, content, television content, things like that, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I have this view. I mean, I'm a big media uh, lover in terms of the tech side, also the content side. We have produced a few movies and uh, TV series. Some were good, some were not so good. But in life, there's always good and bad. Yeah. The, the convenience of the streaming is great. But then, like you say, as a, as a movie person, not appreciating the effort, the resources, the the tears, the blood. To, to, that, to, to, to put right? it onto a yeah. big screen that exactly. they do and then, yeah. and then having somebody sitting there in a, in a I actually it wasn't a plane, it was a, it was a train going into New York City and it, was just a, and it was just kind of almost offensive, you know, because yeah. that movie was such a grand scale. You should have just confiscated the, the phone. Yeah, right? then I get punched out. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But no, I mean, uh, you know, but, but uh, what it does do is it opens up that much more content um, sure. to people who might not necessarily go, you know, which is one of the great I things. mean, this streaming whole, you know, industry, it, it's a new thing, newish yeah. thing. And it really, it really epitomizes what our podcast is about, which is anything is possible. Yeah. Now, you could be sitting in India, in Africa, if you have Wi-Fi, even if you don't have Wi-Fi, there are ways of getting access to... Absolutely, data, right? and that's and 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 that is definitely a boon to this technology and 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 to the future because it does bring that much more creative content mm. um, um, to the public. And also, another thing is probably it creates a new format, which is people's attention span is much shorter now. They only want to watch ten minutes or five minutes. Yes, but then look at Quibi. Mm. Quibi died. You know um, um, whether or not they overhyped it. Um, I. My friends here, um, Marco, who I was talking about, the filmmaker who lives here, he loved the Quibi. He loved the whole aspect of Quibi. I thought it was just ridiculous. Um, and and it, it obviously did not do very well. I mean, I also, one of my clients is also a streamer. It's called Haiflex, which is a Jewish-themed 
streaming network in okay. the U.S. Okay. So, you know, I mean, uh, of course I like streaming because it's got high flicks. And it okay, great. And um, regarding success, what, how would you define success and how would one go about achieving it? Success, it's all in the mind. You know, I mean, it's, 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 if you could be happy with whatever. Um, uh, I'm going to segue from show business for a second. Please. Uh, be, uh, you know, in 1999, my 14 year old son uh, contracted meningococcal meningitis and lost his arms and legs. Um, legs through the knees, arms about here and here. When he woke up after a, a two month coma and we told him what happened, Instead of him going crazy and breaking down, he looked at us and he said, okay. He was never depressed. He'd get angry and frustrated, like, you know, trying to do things and, you know, when they tried to put prosthetics on him and stuff like that. But he never got depressed because while we were in rehab after, after, after three months in the, in the burn unit in the hospital, we used to sneak him out because he was playing sports. He was a hockey person. So we used to, and, and he wanted, a, his, his prosthetists were already talking about trying to build him legs, hockey legs, and it wasn't gonna happen. But then he discovered sled hockey. So we were taking him out and sneaking him out and telling the, the nurses and the doctors we're just gonna bring him home for lunch. We bring him to the Westchester Skating Academy, put on sweat socks, duct tape sticks to him, and do that. Um, and, Within um, two years, he segued to a different sport, which he, he fought all the way, called World Wheelchair Rug, uh, Rugby. Wheel, wheelchair Rugby. Um, within about a year after that, he was on the U.S. developmental team, and that was 2005 in Rio. And in 2008 in, in Beijing, he won the gold medal um, uh, at the Paralympics and was the MVP of the gold medal game. Bravo. And he continued on, uh, won four World Cups, uh, 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 won the bronze in London in 2012, and um, also won, won four national championships, one right after another in, in wheelchair rugby, which is also called murder ball. Um, and then he started speaking, and he traveled the country speaking about meningitis and, and vaccination. Um, he had a, he's just had a book about him has come out that somebody wrote. He was supposed to be in Ethiopia this summer working on a movie about uh, disabilities in third world countries. And unfortunately, on April 15th, he oh. died oh, I'm sorry um, at 35 years old. But Nick lived his life fully because he wasn't going to let anything put him down. He wasn't going to let, uh, you know, something like losing your arms and legs sure. destroy your life. It's, it's a positive thing. And that goes back to your question about success and positivity. Anybody can be positive. Everybody, you know, you, know, you can let it so easily slip away and, and, and get lazy and, and, and fall away from being positive. Or you can just say, I'm live, I'm doing this and you know, and I'm gonna live every minute and that's success. Gary, I'm very, very humbled to hear the story, very honored to hear the story. Um, this is exactly the spirit and epitome of anything is possible. We don't let yeah. anything well, get when in you the said, way. When you said that earlier, I said, oh, have I got a story for him? I love it, thank you, I appreciate it. It's a sad story, but I, I really appreciate the positive energy that yeah. you and, and Nick have, it's, uh, very, it's an honor. Yeah. Um, we've we've interviewed a lot of people in previous episodes, um, which hopefully we can, I can share with you. One is a uh, with a lady called Malvika Ayer. She's only 25, 26, young girl, India. She suffered a bomb blast in India when she was 13 years old. So her arms have been. Um, she lost her arms, her legs. She's in pain, walking 10 minutes every day. Mm -hmm. She was in hospital for three or four years. Again, she showed the same. Anything is possible spirit like Nick where she didn't let that get to her. She was frustrated of course because she couldn't do a lot of things that she couldn't do. She yeah. went on to become one of the top um, disability rights activists globally. She helped to manage uh, President Modi's social media accounts during Women's Independence Day. Mm -hmm. um, she speaks a lot for Davos and the World Economic Forum and she's a, a speaker that goes around the world inspiring young people. And that's what Nick was doing too. Yeah, it was, exactly. you know, I mean it's very similar because especially because when he got sick when he was 14, so people wanted him to come, you know, to, to come and do these things. And 
Sure. And then we have another guest called Richard Turner, as a brother to me now. Um, there's a Sundance Film Festival move, uh, documentary called Delt, which talks about Richard. He's mm -hmm. the world's greatest card mechanic. He doesn't like saying magician, mm -hmm. um, but he turned blind when he was nine years old. And this I heard of. I've you, heard you of this You might have one. seen yeah. it. It's a very inspiring story. And he became the best because he's thinking, how can blindness stop me? Yeah. I mean, Dick didn't have arms and legs. He just didn't, you know... He did everything else. He drove a car. He had girlfriends. He just was missing a few parts, you know. Good stuff. Um, and is there any any um, situations where you can share with the audience where um, you wanted to give up? You didn't. No, I, no, never. That's never my attitude. Um, you know, as I said, Nick got sick in '99. In 2008, uh, we were in Beijing, uh, where he won the gold medal and was the MVP of the of the gold medal game. And the next day, his mother died, because my wife didn't come with me uh, because she, had, my daughter was with me, my mother, you know, we all went out to watch Nick in the Olympics. Nancy was home in a hospital, and she died before we got back on a plane the next day of liver cancer. And you know, when Nick first got sick, Nancy and I looked at each other and, and Olivia and said, "Well, now this is just our new normal. You know, we just live day to day. It's our new normal." When Nancy, got, when Nancy died, I said to the same thing to the kids. I said, guys, this is just our new normal. You know, we, she didn't do anything wrong. We didn't do anything wrong. The doctors didn't do anything wrong. It just happened. I agree. And so you, there, you, there was never any anger. There was never anybody to blame. There was never any, you know, and now that Nick died, you know, with great, granted, we had him 22 extra years because he probably should have died that first night in 99. And when Nick died, my daughter and I, of course, you know, of course you're upset and sure. everything, but you know, he had a heart attack. And it's just, it, 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 it was, a, it was um, a repercussion of what happened 22 years ago. It finally caught up to him because his body was so messed up. But you can't be upset about it. I mean, look, I'm, I miss him, but I missed him for one day. Uh, and one day was terrible. And then after that, it was like, all right, Nick's, you know, Nick's gone, but he's always with us. And, you know, and so, you know, no, I haven't had moments where I, I go into despair and wake up in the middle of the night sweating and because there's no reason to it. I mean, what's the point? I agree. Gary, you're a very um, optimistic, very inspiring individual. Thank you. Thank you. Gary, last question. Anything's possible. We want to promote uh, positivity, share it with the world. We want to overcome challenges, which obviously you guys have demonstrated with uh, maximum points. And lastly is to create one world together where we try to promote diversity, to create a more inclusive society mm -hmm. and to eliminate all kinds of prejudice, prejudices. Please share with us your number one advice for our audience, especially younger people um, in life. Everybody's the same, you know, whether you have no arms and legs, whether you're blind, whether you're Asian, whether you're black, everybody's the same. You know, I mean, some people are better than others, mentally and attitude-wise, but no person is better. And, and, and you know, and, and I don't know whether that's growing up in New York City, which was, um, you know, obviously a melting pot of everything where you've grown up with African-Americans and Asians and Jews and disabled and stuff like that. Um, and And... That's what life should be. It should just be normal. I mean, I'm not a big fan of Black Lives Matter because they've always mattered. It's like, you know, it's just, that's just normal. It's natural. Um, you know, Nick was going around, um, you know, promoting um, disabilities. I mean, you know, people, people would look at him and it would be so difficult. You know, uh, they, you go to a restaurant and it was like, well, what does he want? Well, ask him yourself. <laughs> or, you know, well, how is he going to get on the plane? I said, he'll crawl, you know, um, and just make things normal for everybody. And then everybody and then you accept everybody. You don't look at somebody in a wheelchair or or look at somebody from their color and they're different because they're not. Gary, it's an absolute pleasure, honor for me to hear, you know, very wise words. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. You bet.